Hello, my name is Tiffany Talbert, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund's digital series on cultural preservation. In this segment, you'll experience a conversation led by renowned poet, scholar, and the president of the Mellon Foundation, Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, about monument making and the role of historic preservation in fostering healing from racial trauma. Good afternoon, everybody. It is so wonderful to be with you today. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Mellon Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation on monuments and justice. Throughout the United States, and indeed all over the world, monuments and memorials shape our understanding of our collective histories and identities. They instruct, they venerate, they celebrate experiences and perspectives that make up the American story. And at a time when challenges to our freedom to read and to learn in American libraries and classrooms those challenges are on the rise. More than ever, I believe we need monuments that teach and tell the truth about who we are. Because, I love this audience. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, because of the space that they hold in our public uh, imagination, we always have to ask which voices and which histories are not represented by the monuments we see. The imperative to ask these questions helped drive the development of the new national monument that we honor in our discussion today, the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley National Monument. <laughs> these questions also inform the Mellon Monuments Project, which I lead. That project at Mellon aims to accurately represent our collective history in American monuments and memorials so that we can learn the truth about who we are as a country in our public spaces. And crucially, understand why we need new and different monuments if we want to have a more just future. With an initial commitment of $250 million, this initiative represents the single biggest financial commitment that Mellon has ever made. In the three years since we launched the Monuments Project, we have already issued $180 million worth of grants. Throughout that time, the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund has been an inspirational and exemplary grantee and partner. The work it leads continues to give us a clear and truly visionary set of aligned examples as we help reshape the American commemorative landscape. I am very proud to have been one of the Action Fund's initial co-chairs and tremendously moved and literally awed by all it has achieved since 2017. By preserving, restoring, and interpreting sites of African American achievement and resilience, the Action Fund is helping to ensure that future generations see, experience, and have access to this history and these stories. And as the United States faces a sharp increase in book banning and what we are calling the criminalization in some states of learning and knowledge in schools and libraries, work like that which the Action Fund undertakes is especially critical because we encounter it in spaces that you don't have to enter that anyone can come to. In keeping with its name, the Action Fund demonstrates how active the process of cultural preservation is and ought to be. The word itself to preserve comes from the Latin preservare, which means to keep in advance, to set a thing up for longevity today. Preservation is a vital and ceaseless effort that requires contextualizing, interpreting, reimagining, edifying, restoring, and sometimes building anew bringing together voices and expertise in dynamic ways. So this deep collaboration is illustrated by the intensive process that led up to the very moment that President Biden formally recognized the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley National Monument this past July. As we know, the National Monument is composed of three sites central to the stories and legacies of Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley. Our panelists will discuss, discuss each of these sites in our conversation. The Grab All Landing on the banks of the Tallahatchie River in Mississippi, where many believe Till's body was recovered. 
the Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ in Bronzeville, Chicago, the site of Till's open casket funeral, photographed, as we know, by Jet Magazine, and the Tallahatchie County Courthouse in Sumner, Mississippi, where Till's murderers were tried and acquitted. This national monument, as with so many of our stories, would not have come into being without an unshakable commitment to telling the truth about our history over time against odds. This is a commitment that we at Mellon share, and we are very, very proud that our financial support was instrumental in making the designation of the National Monument a reality. We also, and most importantly, celebrate the steadfast dedication and determined coordination of the Till family, community activists, historians, educators, culture workers, and the preservation experts at the Action Fund, among so many others who did this crucial work for decades, carrying and keeping Till's story alive. In my own life as a scholar and writer and poet and professor, I have written about Emmett Till. I have taught his story in three decades of African American studies classes. Every semester, we teach the story of Emmett Till. I have remembered his and emblematic stories like this throughout my own writing, most recently in a book I wrote called The Trayvon Generation, which looks back to, thank you, which looks back to Emmett Till to think about this threat and carrying out of violence that took Till from us and continues to corrode our society and threaten our young people. So the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley National Monument demonstrates the considerable power that monuments hold in shaping justice work, not just storytelling work, but justice work. We're gonna discuss this power in detail during our con conversation, and I would now like to introduce our panelists who I am so honored and so excited to be with today. Dr. Marvell Parker is an author and community leader currently serving as executive director of the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley Institute. She is married to Reverend Wheeling Parker Jr., who is Emmett Till's cousin, and is the only surviving witness of Till's abduction, which he witnessed when he was 16 years old. Dr. Marvell Parker. <laughs> Tiffany Tolbert is a preservation expert and researcher who is currently the Senior Director for Preservation at the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and she has served as the senior project manager for this uh, long, complicated, and powerful, and successful National Monument campaign, Tiffany Tolbert. <laughs> uh, Patrick Weems is the co-founder and first executive director of the Emmett Till Interpretive Center in Sumner, Mississippi. He was a fellow at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and at Monument Lab. There you go. And Dr. Justin S. Hopkins is a clinical psychologist specializing in racial trauma healing. He was an advisor for advocates of the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley National Monument helping frame the site's significance within a broader process of racial healing in the United States, Dr. Justin Hopkins. So we thank you for joining us, and I am now joining you, and uh, we're going to uh, first turn to uh, Patrick and Marvell to review some of, of the visuals that are associated with the monument. You want to start here? Uh, well, this is my turn? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're well prepared. Uh, it is so great to be in this room. Uh, we just feel very honored, but also to stare the stage with um, our guests today. They've, they've helped us get this monument, and it's a real privilege. So this is the, the first site, uh, Grab Ball Landing. This is uh, what Reverend Jesse Jackson said was the big bang of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, this is where Till's body came out of the Tallahatchie River in 1955. It is also where our signs have been repeatedly desecrated, um, shot up, vandalized. Uh, the first one was thrown into the Tallahatchie River the night President Obama was elected president. 
Um, since then, we've had to replace it four times. The, the one you're seeing right now is the uh, bulletproof marker. And the, the question is begged, why does it take this much effort to honor a 14-year-old child in 2023 that we have to put up a bulletproof marker? Um, wonderfully, amazingly, this site was included as one of the National Monument sites. It is federally protected uh, and will be federally protected uh, as long as we have a democracy. Um, so this is Grab All Landing. I oh, know, right. So another you know, two to three years. <laughs> <laughs> we are hopeful people. We are hopeful people. <laughs> okay, four years. Um, so this is, uh, this is the Tallahatchie County Courthouse. Um, this was our, our first site that we restored back to the way it looked in 1955. And this was a community effort. Uh, for 50 years, nobody in Tallahatchie County publicly spoke about Emmett Till. Uh, and it wasn't until the leadership of a man named Jerome G. Little, uh, who grew up four miles from this courthouse as a sharecropper, whose grandparents raised him and didn't tell him the Till story because they didn't want him to grow up with hate. Uh, so he wasn't able to learn about the Till story until he joined the military. He came back um, and, and, and learned the story over there, overseas. He then ran as a board of supervisor in Tallahatchie County. Our county is 80% black in his district, and we hadn't had a board of supervisor elected until 1994. Uh, he did this by organizing, by, by uh, shutting off the highway. He was a, a true just uh, soldier for this work. Uh, but when he got elected, he called Mamie Till and he said, I want you to know that we haven't forgotten about Emmett Till. And so he, uh, created the Emmett Till Memorial Commission, which is now the organization that I'm a part of, uh, and restored this site back to the way it looked in 1955 after first uh, getting the county to publicly apologize to the Till family, and it's where I met Dr. Parker. Do you want to add about, um, about the sites? Well, the Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ in Chicago is the site uh, that was chosen by, by Mamie to uh, host Emmett's funeral. The, uh, originally the wake was at the A.A. A. Rainer funeral home, but there were so many people uh, trying to, to view the body, they moved him before the funeral to the church. And they still continued the visitation for about three more days before they actually held the funeral. It is said that more than 100,000 people uh, viewed the casket and the mutilated body of Emmett Till uh, at Roberts Temple, and it is said that Mamie's will to allow the world to see the ugly face of racism and hatred and what uh, had been done to her son is said to have been the catalyst that sparked the civil rights movement. And as a result of uh, many, 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 many years of work uh, Chicago declared Roberts Temple as a city of Chicago landmark in 2005. And since 2017, we have been working diligently to uh, make this church a national monument. And that was done July 25th in a proclamation uh, signed by uh, President Joe Biden. And I'm gonna say it, guys, and in the proclamation, <laughs> He has listed the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley Institute as stewards of the site. Mm -hmm. And so it is our endeavor to make this a museum to make the world proud of. Mm, mm, mm. And, and could you um, also say uh, some more about why the Chicago piece was important in telling the whole story? Well, originally when uh, Patrick invited my husband and I to come to uh, Mississippi and to Washington to uh, show that the family supported his endeavor to uh, get the courthouse and the Mississippi sites as a national landmark, uh, I felt that Emmett's life ended in Mississippi, but he had a life before he went to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And I felt that his life needed to be celebrated, not just his death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even though, uh, 
Chicago was the site of his funeral, but we have been able to tell the story of the life of this 14-year-old young boy who was vigorous and energetic with his beautiful eyes, who loved to play jokes. We've let the world know that he was a person mm -hmm. and someone that was loved and someone that has been greatly missed. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could stay with you for a minute also, you know, I think for so many years we would talk about the story of Emmett Till, but now Mamie Till Mobley is a part of how we will always talk about that story. And that is, uh, that's true. Uh, on, her, uh, on her deathbed, basically, she asked my husband and I if we would take up the work that she had been doing all of those years to make sure that Emmett's legacy and that his death was not in vain. And in agreeing to do that, I mean, we didn't really know where to start, but what has happened is not only have we been instrumental in preserving the legacy of Emmett Till, but we're also preserving the legacy of Mamie Till Mobley, who her, heroes, her heroism is what has caused us to understand and know the story of Emmett. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, Tiffany, if you could walk us through some of the nuts and bolts, uh, the, the, the project uh, itself, and also about your first encounter with the sites. Of course. So our work with Emmett Till, both in Mississippi and Chicago, have been going on for a number of years. We had supported the Emmett Till Interpretive Center with an action fund grant for capacity building to add staff, paid staff, we were talking to Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ um, about 11 most endangered. There was concern on the structural condition of the church that the congregation observed. They were not using the sanctuary and we listed it on 11 most endangered. We then engaged a engineering firm to do a complete structural assessment of the building so that the church could really understand what was going on. And then we provided an action fund grant to do temporary stabilization of Roberts Temple to address those immediate priority issues that the engineering report addressed. But at the same time that we were doing this work, there was already a movement started around creating a national historic site. And it was looking at Mississippi, and then as Dr. Parker said, connecting to Chicago. And so our organizations, both um, ETIC, National Trust, Action Fund, National Parks Conservation Association, and others were developing strategies of how we could accomplish this. And there were a couple of tracks that we put in place, really wanted to go through Congress. And so we were looking to get a bill out of Mississippi that would create a national historic site and then connect to Chicago. Um, Senators Duckworth and Durbin in Illinois with Senator Cory Booker and Senators Hyde Smith and Wicker in Mississippi did introduce a bill in the Senate in 2021 mm -hmm. to designate Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ as a national historic site and we saw that as a path that we could then pull in Mississippi um, to create this. But then we got a notion that um, the president and the Department of the Interior are really interested in doing National Monument and using the Antiquities Act and his executive authority. And we said, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we were, you know, it was pretty clear that this was the path and we held off on the legislative route and really worked hand in hand with the Secretary of the Interior, Department of the Interior and Administration to get to what did occur on July 25th. And really what that involved was real estate. It was really trying to identify which sites would be in that proclamation. There are three sites in the monument, but total, even in Mississippi and Chicago, there are probably about 15 or more sites that support this story. And we really had to look to say, what are the sites, one, that we could quickly acquire that were willing to work with us work with the Department of the Interior um, because Interior did need an ownership footprint in each of these properties, so we needed willing property owners. We also wanted to make sure the sites represented this story. Mm -hmm. As Dr. Parker said, this is not just about death, it's about life, so understanding all components of that. Very early in this process, the Secretary of the Interior did say to us, you know, this is a story about movement. It's movement from Chicago to Mississippi throughout the Delta, then back to Chicago. And so we thought that we could not tell this complete story without having multiple sites for people to understand. So we spent about 18 months working behind the scenes to 
identify which sites were suitable for the Department of the Interior, working with their solicitors because they really wanted the President's proclamation to not be challenged legally. And so we wanted to make sure that everything was done correctly, and it was a lot of behind the scenes work. The Action Fund and the National Trust supported Roberts Temple mm -hmm. and um, ETIC in understanding the legalities around the monument creation, easement discussions, property acquisition. We were in there, and I would say every level of the National Trust from our legal department to finance the Action Fund. Um, Brent probably was tired of me calling because I was like, mm -hmm. They will need something else, or can we do that? He always said yes, and from the top down, no one said no. And this really came down to that Friday before. <laughs> um, it was signed on Tuesday about 1.30. We were waiting for all of the real estate transactions to be done. I was working from home at my dining room table, and the title company in Chicago was waiting. I was talking to finance of ours in D.C. Oh for money to get there, and Interior was like, don't go. We don't have the green light yet. And I was just like, and then finally said, okay, go. And we closed on the real estate transfer for Roberts Temple. Um, the church generously donated the parking lot to the federal government. They still maintain ownership of the building. Um, and we were like, okay, we're done. And then Tuesday, we were in the White House and the president was signing the proclamation. Um, but mm -hmm. it was, uh, <laughs> it was a very um, detailed, well-coordinated effort between multiple, multiple partners and people around the country that wanted to see this happen. And we worked hand in hand with the Department of the Interior and the administration every step of the way. But we also wanted to ensure, particularly for Roberts Temple and Dr. Parker, it's important for me that the church understood what this mean. We wanted their interests to be protected. We wanted them to know what they were agreeing to, making sure that they maintained access to the parking lot and the use of the church as they always did. Um, we never wanted to put anything in front of them that they did not understand. And our legal department was very good about explaining the easements and the covenants and negotiating with Interior on yeah. things that just would not work for them to be able to continue to use this church. Um, and so that was, I saw our role as being that facilitator between the partners on the ground that have been doing this work for decades and what this monument meant and making sure that we were approaching this culturally sensitive, yes. we were being um, appropriate, <laughs> we were mm -hmm. being respectful, and we were making sure that they were not, it was always gonna be supported by the community and the property owners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing. Patrick, what is your journey to, to this work besides your leadership in this work? Um, that's a good question. Um, so I, I grew up in Mississippi. Uh, I grew up not knowing the Till story. Uh, it wasn't until I was uh, 18 years old. I took a specific African-American course uh, my senior year of high school, and I had a teacher who went out of her way uh, to make sure that I knew this story. And it was that moment that a lot of people have where, where you, you learn about Till and the, the earth shakes underneath you. Um, and for me, it was how could I, at 18, you know everything. I don't know if y'all felt that way. I knew everything. <laughs> uh, I knew everything. Uh, and, and, and then I realized I didn't and that this had been purposely hidden. And, and then I had to go, well, why was it purposely hidden? And so my construct as a uh, white male growing up in Mississippi, everything started to fall apart. And it was an egg that broke that allowed me to then start to understand, well, we'll ask more questions. Uh, and luckily, I was able to join the William Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation that was started at the Center for Southern Studies. And we've got Bill Ferris here who started that center. Um, and they worked with communities that had undergone historical racial trauma, places like Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the three civil rights workers were killed. And they worked with, the, with that community, uh, and that community decided they couldn't build a memorial to the three civil rights workers because the, the murderers were still alive. Uh, and they had to do a call for justice before they built a monument. And so they led, that led to the conviction of Edgar Ray Killen, who was the main perpetrator and orchestrator. Our community in Tallahatchie County saw that. And as an intern, I got to sit in on these early meetings of uh, black and white folks for the first time sitting down in a space and figuring out how they're gonna break that silence. And, and that was just a, an amazing learning experience 
um, and, and, and to learn not only about the tragedy, but how people responded to the tragedy and thinking about the Emmett Till generation and how people like John Lewis and others um, used Till's murder to get engaged politically and to change the system. Um, and and as again, as an 18-year-old, I, I thought everything was stuck in stone. It was concrete. It was almost like those Confederate monuments. I thought that we could never change, and I'd have to leave the state. Um, but it gave me enough hope to say if young people in the 60s and 70s could make that much change in Mississippi, maybe I could stay and, and make some change. And so uh, maybe those statues don't have to be there forever, right? And that we can create new monuments, memorials that tell the fuller story. So uh, I am blessed beyond belief to be able to be a part of this work. And I, National Trust is a big part of that. I, I, they told me you could have the job at, at the Interpretive Center. We're about to finish the courthouse, but it comes with no money. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, great. Well, I'm a grad student, so that's not a surprise. I just eat ramen noodles. Um, but realized that that wasn't going to last forever. And so the, the biggest monumental gift for us was a $5,000 gift from the National Trust um, that allowed us to have community conversations about what we could do with that courthouse. And, and that kept me uh, in the fight a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And I mean, just to underscore that this whole journey began with a class in high school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just talking about what we're up against now, about what can and can't be taught. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Justin, I would like you to talk with us about what's at stake when we try to tell stories in public about violence and trauma? Sure. Um, th there's, there's so much at stake. And it, it's, such a, it, it's such a challenge. It's, 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 it's a bind trying to heal. Um, being healed is wonderful, right? But the, the process of healing is disruptive. Mm. It's uncomfortable. Uh, and it's often painful, and you, you do that work in order to actually feel better at the end, but um, it, it takes time, it takes effort, and it often gets worse before it gets better. Um, and particularly when we're talking about healing trauma, um, it's kind of a paradox, because to heal trauma, you have to, kind of, you, you have to confront your worst memories and experiences. You have to interact with your own anguish, which we understandably may want to avoid. But when we don't, this is what's at stake, when we don't, we neglect our wounds, our wounds fester, our trauma compounds, and we're actually more susceptible to uh, developing a more prolonged state of suffering where our healing is inhibited. And the very trauma we're trying to avoid actually ends up playing out in different ways in the present. Um, I, um, if I could share a quick story, because I'm, I'm a clinician at heart, so I'm approaching this as a clinician. Uh, I, I worked at a couple of Veterans Affairs hospitals, and I was on the PTSD clinical teams, uh, working with veterans with all sorts of trauma, and that's post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, what I learned about trauma is that when something traumatic happens, everyone has a response. Everyone's impacted by it, but not everyone develops PTSD. Mm -hmm. To get a diagnosis of PTSD, you have to have symptoms for at least six months. That's the criteria, an unabated trauma response for at least half a year. Right. So PTSD can kind of be thought of as an interruption in the natural healing process because some people don't develop it and, and, and they recover. But what the research shows is that the difference between those who develop PTSD and those who don't often comes down to one cluster of symptoms. Uh, and, that, and that cluster of symptoms are called uh, avoidance. Hmm. Those who develop PTSD were more likely to exhibit symptoms of avoidance, meaning they didn't want to remember, acknowledge. What, what had happened because it was so painful. And really, it's the last thing we want to do is remember and relive it, right? I mean, our minds, we, we're quite savvy at disengaging from things that we don't want to engage with. Mm -hmm. um, we, we can do that unconsciously, but the, the more we avoid, uh, the more our healing is stunted, the, the more susceptible we are to prolonged suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really, really puts us at a disadvantage, right? Um, in, in terms of healing. And actually, our avoidance reinforces the trauma because it tells us not only the trauma itself is threatening, but even the reminders of the trauma are threatening as well, and those must be avoided. This is part of how trauma compounds. So in the American sense, obviously, we have avoided reckoning with our trauma. We've avoided 
reckoning with uh, the racial reality. Um, and, and with every generation, this was alluded to, there, there are renewed efforts to deny the crimes of white supremacy, to uh, deny the, the violence and oppression that black Americans experience, and the privileges that white Americans experience via that dynamic. So we have a societal PTSD. And, and I think our 400 years far outseeds six months. Uh, it's, it's, it's embedded into the fabric of our society, so much so that we're also afraid of the reminders. So this is, this is in part why white Americans and law enforcement uh, so readily may fear black skin, right? The, the efforts to ban our books and, and curriculum, um, our trauma is being passed down from generation to generation unhealed. So, so what's at stake is, is just continued suffering and we, we can't avoid what's happened. So um, we, we either kind of deal with the truth or the truth will keep dealing with us. Yeah. Mm. So, and, and, and this is where our, our monuments come in because when, when used to accurately depict the events of history, they can be our mirrors. Yeah. They, they can give us a window into who we are because nothing helps us understand the present like the past. Mm -hmm. so, so when we preserve our history, the work that you all are doing, it actually preserves opportunities for us to heal as stubborn as our country is. It gives us the chance to reckon with our truth and, and to be more whole. So I, I think we have to be brave enough to bear witness to the atrocities of history and, and also strong enough, uh, or human enough rather, to, to, be, to take it in, be impacted, changed by it, and, and do the, the difficult work of, of actually healing. And, and how do you... And, and how do you think about the very specific challenge of storytelling in place where you can't control who comes and one person who comes might be learning for the first time and someone else who comes has a lifetime of very you know, personal connection to the trauma? And you're not there. <laughs> right, right. I'm not, I can't do therapy for every visitor who's, yeah. Uh, well, well, that's well. That's why this paradigm of healing is so important, right? Be, because um, it, it says that we're going to feel all sorts of stuff along the journey, and and, it, and it's not for us to shy away from, especially if you're if you're not so familiar with the history. And then I, I really appreciated your story, Patrick. Right? Like you, you had to allow you, your identity to. Uh, come up, come apart a bit, so you could be built back up more solid, and, you know, and, and founded on um, the, the the truth of our history, right? And we all have to go through some sort of process like that. We all remember the moments, right? Like when we learned that we were black, right, or or that we learned what whiteness was. But uh, I think it's important for people who are visiting, if we can kind of spread this paradigm of healing, to so when they go, to be with what's happening inside your body. Recognize how your breath may shorten, your, your muscles may tighten, your, your stomach may constrict, and, and think about what that's about. Make meaning of it. Like that's, I, 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 I wonder if at our sites we can somehow invite people to just try to be present with what's happening in their bodies so, so that they can um, do the individual work that they need to do to, to confront um, their, their healing, uh, their, their trauma, and, and actually heal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could you add something about, about this larger question of trauma? Well, as he was speaking about the PTSD, uh, I'd like to say that that's something that my husband was victimized by for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And what he did was he did not accept that that was Emmett's body in the casket. Mm -hmm. So he never cried. He never felt any sorrow because he rejected that that was him. He said, I'm going to see him again. Mm. But after 50 years, he began to shed tears. And now whenever he uh, is faced with talking about him and telling the story, he weeps. And at 84, he says, I'm too old to be crying now. Mm. But it's, a, it's cathartic and it's a healing process for him. But it has taken uh, all of this time for him to, to heal, to, to begin to heal because it has taken all this time for him to accept that, that, that it really was Emmett. And that came about in 2005 when Emmett's body was exhumed. 
Uh, the family gave permission for the body to be exhumed. <clears throat> My husband said, let's leave the country, and we did. He didn't want to be present during the exhumation. Wow. And we went to Puerto Rico, came back, and of course the body was positively identified as Emmett. And so the family said to my husband, who is a minister, we want you to do the recommittal service. Wow. Mm. So graveside recommittal service, he presided over the second entombment of Emmett. And it was the most difficult thing that I've seen him do. I've been married to him for 56 years now. Mm. And it was the most difficult thing I've, I've seen him do. Uh, but he has begun to heal. He said his prayer has been answered that now the truth about Emmett is being told because his heart was broken at the imagery that was projected, that he got what he deserved mm -hmm. or that he must have done something wrong mm -hmm. for them to brutalize him like that. And that broke his heart because he said he was never, he was never that kind of kid. He had never had sex. He never had a girlfriend and all of those stories that, uh, Carolyn Bryant told about him sexually molesting her uh, was, were false. Mm -hmm. but a lot of the world believed it mm -hmm. because they justified, they had to justify what was done. And in justifying what was done, they said he must have done something. Mm -hmm. And the only thing he did as a mannish young boy was he did do the whiff whistle. He did whistle. But if you read her memoir, she says he sexually assaulted her. Mm -hmm. That's what she testified in the court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to get a sense of how um, the Mississippi Monument exists in place, in community, in uh, you know, on the ground, if you if you will, and what this new designation and the work that's being done, uh, what is hoped for. Well, we're we're excited. I mean, I think we were holding on by a prayer just to to, to exist as an organization, um, and then to get this uh, forever. Uh, you know, designation. And um, right now, uh, the Park Service is looking at their budget to see if they can actually appropriate enough funds for us to have a permanent superintendent, staff, um, be able to have educational programs. I'm out of an office, which is great, right? So they've taken over my office, they've taken over our space. Um, but it felt, when we went out to the river site on, on August 28th, which is the Memorial Day for Till, um, and we went to that river site, and I've been to it so many times, and I, I went to it when we put up the third marker, and I went out there when that third marker was shot within uh, six, four weeks of it being up uh, by some students at the University of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, and I went out there, and we had a full Park Service patrol there, mm -hmm. 24 hours, uh, three days ahead of the service. Um, and for it to finally be honored the way that it always should have um, is, 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 a, is an amazing um, moment. And it, it, this, this should have been honored from day one. It has taken us this long, um, but I'm glad that it's finally being honored the way that it ought to be honored. Mm -hmm. um, and so to see, to see the reinforcements um, from, from the National Park Service is just unbelievable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tiffany? So with Robert's Temple in Chicago, much of the same, though Robert's Temple, as you see here on the screen, um, did undergo a renovation in the early 2000s um, for the church, which put a new facade on the front as well as they altered the interior sanctuary. And we, along with advocating for the monument, were working with the Till Institute and the church to start to plan to restore the church in preparation for interpretation as a national monument. So we are looking for a park service um, as they'll be hiring for Mississippi. They'll also hire a site director in Chicago and support and interpretive staff. So we're really happy that they've identified funding in the current appropriations bill um, that is going now. So they wanna hire a total of 18 positions between Chicago and Mississippi mm -hmm. to staff the site. But with support from the Mellon Foundation from your monuments project, as well as through our Preserving Black Churches Initiative, we are going to invest close to $4 million, which will start to restore first the facade of the church. Um, we're really excited. We 
were there in September with our architectural team who did some investigation on the facade and the original facade is still underneath there in fairly good condition. Um, it, I got to go up on the lift, so it's pretty fun. Um, and there's an original steel window there. And so our first project will be um, hopefully starting in the spring to um, restore the facade. And then we're also um, engaging with our consultant team to plan for the restoration of the interior. Um, the sanctuary was fairly altered, so it does not appear as it did at the funeral. But there's something interesting about this building, I think, from a preservation practice um, standpoint, as we talk about interpretation and how people will interact with these sites, is that through the investigation of the interior, we will be able to come up with a plan to see how much original fabric is still there that could be restored, as well as what might just be an adaptive you know, solution for the sanctuary. But there's a lot in the bones of this church that I think helps you understand how people were able to experience that event in 1955. Again, I said it's the story of movement, but as you see from the image of the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that were there, mm -hmm. there was a movement throughout this building, you know, that the church coordinated as people viewed the body um, being there on State Street, coming in, coming up the stairs, into the sanctuary, then out the side door where they had chairs so that people could compose themselves just to keep people moving. Um, even understanding how the casket was brought into the sanctuary. It's, um, it's still there, it's covered, but it was a, a ladder in the basement where they physically lifted the casket up through the floor of the sanctuary of an opening. And so I think it will be great through studying the building, developing that plan is how to meld how the building itself contributed to how the community were able to interact with this event. Roberts Temple has a long history, it was founded in 1916, had a very prominent role in the Great Migration. And I think all of that history led up to how Roberts Temple could only be the place for this to occur mm -hmm. in 1955, just because of how prominent was the connection of the Till family to the Church of God in Christ. And a lot of that is visible in the building, how it grew, how it expanded. It needed to be a place for all things on the south side of Chicago for the African American community. So it was waiting and to be ready for an event like this to occur both then previously and in the future. And so there's a very unique opportunity with all of these sites is to really set a precedent for how we interpret these spaces and tell this type of story. There's no site like this in the National Park Service system that tells this specific type of history, lynching African American. We will set the precedent for how the federal government tells the story at these sites. Mm. So, we're very privileged to be in the position working with all our partners, the Till Institute, to do that, and with support from Mellon, from the National Trust, the Action Fund, Lilly Endowment, that this will be a monumental, quote unquote, mm -hmm. <laughs> undertaking. But there's so much to be learned from this, and people can still learn from this building today when they come to Chicago, when they go to Mississippi. There's a lot that you can learn just from being in these spaces, um, just emotionally. And mm -hmm. I look forward to our preservation practice really developing that interpretation as well. Mm -hmm. yes. And I see you and I see you nodding. Tell us about your experience with this space. Well, one of the things I, I think is going to really happen in interpreting uh, Robert's Temple is the history of the Church of God in Christ and its role in American history is also going to be told. Mm -hmm. uh, not only did the Church of God in Christ host the funeral of uh, Emmett Till, but in New York, when they couldn't find a church to host the funeral of Malcolm X. That was a church of God in Christ that opened its doors to host the funeral of Malcolm X. And we all know that Mason Temple in Memphis, Tennessee is the site of the final sermon and speech that was given by Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. His mountaintop speech was done from the pulpit of Mason Temple Church of God in Christ, uh, founded by Bishop C.H. Mason and the connection with Bishop Mason and Bishop Roberts is that Bishop Roberts was Bishop Mason's assistant pastor in Memphis. Mm -hmm. But a group of women started a church in Chicago, mm -hmm. Mother Lillian Brooks Coffee, and Bishop Mason sent his assistant pastor to Chicago to pastor that group of women, and it became Roberts Temple, Church mm -hmm. of God in Christ. Well, I mean, this is just so rich because um, the breadth of the contextualization, I mean, I think about that film that we have, 
uh, the film I taught with, the film that we are no doubt all familiar with of people going past the coffin, of people falling out in grief, of people supporting each other. And when you look at that film, uh, the grief and the uh, emotion and the trauma is quite palpable. Yes. But what you're describing here is a community context, a spiritual context, a geographical context, you know, all of the things that have enabled us yes. to move through this uh, grief in extremis. Yes. Yeah, 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 wow. One of the things that we did do part of the monument process, the Department of the Interior asked us to develop a national statement of significance for Roberts Temple because it wasn't on the National Register of Historic Places. But the consultant did an excellent job of centering Roberts Temple and its role. Mm -hmm. And it really talks to that its location as a black church with black leaders in a black community allowed, gave agency over what happened at that mm -hmm. funeral. It gave agency over the messaging. You know, if you, when you read the statement talking about the speeches that were delivered, it was a call to action about injustice, about racial violence. And again, because it was Robert's Temple, it gave the black community a place to do that openly and publicly without being oppressed by mm -hmm. the, uh, the other um, government mm -hmm. or other white led entities there. And so Robert's Temple represents all of that. Mm -hmm. And I want and hope people will see that when they come into that space. And you can feel it when you come into that space, even today, mm -hmm. with it unrestored. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Justin, I'd like to talk some more about American storytelling, uh, American trauma, American violence, uh, moving from this story to, you know, it's a thing that we talk about in the Monuments Project. There are so many stories that are untold and underrepresented. Mm -hmm. So we just saw a site where there was a massacre of Chinese Americans in Los Angeles in 1871, and there will be a monument to that. There is a monument in book form to the, that contains all the names from the 75 internment camps where Japanese Americans were interned uh, at, during and, and after World War II. You know, so all of these stories of resilience, but also of uh, of tremendous trauma. Can you, can, you, can you take us out a little bit and talk about the larger American storytelling? Um, where where your, your question takes me is, is just uh, thinking about the, the bind that America is in and, and how it's often so attached to its sense of personal goodness that it's, it's hard for, for our country to really reflect and be honest and have a more ro robust and organized and healthy ego. And instead, it's, it's built on a lot of denial and a lot of avoidance. And, and I, I don't even think America is all that unique in its sense, although there are unique aspects to the duration of American slavery and the depth of anti-black racism in this country. But, but I think where we stand out the most is in our avoidance. And I, I, think, I do think uh, Germany with the Holocaust is a good comparison in this regard, because in that country, you, you can't go too far without seeing some sort of recognition of the lives that were lost, that there was genocide attempted on that land. It, it took that country a while but it became committed to telling the story and reckoning with what has happened. But in America, we, we have Confederate flags, right? Like we, we have statues to prominent figures of insurrection and, and treason through the, the Civil War. So I, I think where we stand out the most, where we're most remarkable is with our delusions and, and, and our unwillingness to tell the stories of history um, that, that need to be told. And so I, I do believe that, I, I don't believe time heals all wounds. I think it, it depends on what we do with the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I do think with the work that we're doing to, to kind of show a mirror to our country and tell the appropriate stories, it, it gives meaning, it, 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 it's an invitation and an opportunity to grow and for our country to not be so infantile in its sense of self. This is what maturing as a society looks like. 
-hmm. it, it's dealing with the, the, the joys and, and the stories of trauma and pain, and we need both in order to feel a healthy, to be, to be a healthy society. Mm. And then to, to follow up, um, from your understanding of, uh, of the individual and individual therapy, right? I, I mean, how do you come from, how do you come to a we? When one, I, I, again, I'm thinking about our simultaneous learning, right? When one party may have an intimate experience with the violence and the trauma, and another one is just learning. How do we come together in we? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because we, we all have trauma in our bodies, but it's different. Mm -hmm. the, the, the trauma is different for white Americans, for other people of color, and, and for black Americans. Um, coming to a we is difficult because there's, um, there's such effort to not see one group mm -hmm. in, in particular. Um, but I, I, I think we, we come together as a, as a we by persisting and telling our narrative and creating opportunities to kind of feel um, the, the reality of our country. And, and I think monuments and uh, preserving places of history are so, are so important because those are spiritual experiences, mm -hmm. right? Because racism supersedes logic. Like it's, mm -hmm. it, it supersedes conversation and intellect. Right, it's, so we, we need to have experiences, right? Like where we're feeling um, the, the, the trauma that we've experienced. And I, I, I think so for, for white Americans, the work that we're doing is especially important so that there are experiences where they are feeling rather than just thinking uh, in, in terms of the trauma. I always use the word we because that, that's, um, that's, that's just me approaching things at a therapist and, and getting in the mud in the muck of the issue. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I recognize dealing with trauma is not easy. And um, I, so I see, I see myself as being an active participant in healing it. Um, but I think our trauma is, is, is quite different and ours is more so about being good stewards of our pain mm -hmm. and, and, and being able to give ourselves permission to be human and give ourselves grace that the, the country won't. Thank you. Um, this remarkable hour has moved very quickly. So um, coming out of this, of this beautiful and powerful conversation, starting with you, Tiffany, moving down, and we will, we will conclude here. If you could each uh, uh, just leave us uh, with a thought that you want us to carry out of this conversation. I, I guess I, I have thought about this, and my role in the work to get to this point and the work that will continue. But I will just say we're all so fortunate to be working in this space and to, particularly with African American history, it's a pleasure to work on sites and projects where you see yourself, you see your family, you see your history and legacy, whether it's the black church or HBCU or a neighborhood or a cemetery. And to use that as inspiration to use your professional talents is something that I would say never devalue, never lose sight of. It helps you connect, it helps you relate to those you're working with, and it makes it that more important. And so I'm very fortunate that Dr. Parker and Reverend Parker and Roberts Temple entrusted me to work with them on this journey, and I look forward to welcoming all of you all to Roberts Temple and to really learn the story in person on State Street in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick? Um, my, my thought is around, uh, there's a term, and it, you, you helped bring it up for me, it was the, a moral imagination within peace building studies and, and this idea that we need arts and storytelling and historic preservation to prosper process the past pains and trauma that have happened in society. Um, and, and that's almost the first thing we need to do. We don't need to add more infrastructure or all the rest. That's important, but we need to process this pain um, so that we can imagine how our society is going to move forward. And, and the idea of what can we envision for our grandchildren. And if we can get past this immediate of right here uh, and start to imagine that future, I think we'll be in a better place. Thank you. Hey, I'll, I'll simply add that I just think it's, it's such a privilege to do this kind of work and um, um, to be a part of um, 
uh, preservation work in the, in the way that I was and, and just being a clinician at heart, I, I truly do believe that the work we're doing is about healing our country. And um, it's, it's, it's a privilege to be a part of that, that healing process. And um, my, my hope is that, um, like, like Patrick said, that, that future generations will inherit less trauma. And um, it's no one's responsible for all of the wounds. But I, I do think we're responsible to leave a better tomorrow for the generations to come. And, and, and the work that we're doing is doing just that. Thank you. Dr. Marvell Parker. Well, what I'd like to see visitors that will uh, embrace Chicago and attend the Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ National Monument, our goal is to engage, to educate, and to empower. That's it. That's it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Hello. I'm Felicia Bashad, and I serve as co-chair for the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. Thank you for joining us for this year-long digital series which highlights the cultural preservation movement that's happening all over our nation in the name of saving historic African-American spaces. We're glad you're here. And we hope you're encouraged to support the preservation of historic African-American buildings and spaces. <laughs>